Somebody told me they were going to put water bottles all around here. I didn't know that they were actually going to do it. But thank you, whoever did it. So, because I have been known to forget them. Um, um, I had a weird experience this week, and um, and some of you may have had it before too. Um, I had my first meeting with some people at the convention, and since you know my what I found out and all that stuff, and and so I I, I was of course late getting there for some reason, and uh, I'm blaming on the kids. Um, <laughs> and um, so I walk in there, and um, and and they, you know, there's not a lot of talking, right? And so finally, my friend Jim goes. We're having a real good conversation until you got in here. I'm like, so I took my pulse. I said, "Well, I'm still alive, so come on." I mean, but it was it was kind of it was kind of weird, you know. It's kind of weird, but I understand. I, I get it. Um, people are a little uncomfortable and uh, don't know what to say and all those things. But you all have been such a blessing. Thank you for your kind words and encouragement and and. Uh, and all of those things. So, well, we're going to talk about a name today. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about Memorial Day and, and the names. And I've had the privilege of going to Washington, D.C., not to talk to any politician, but uh, to, uh, boy, that didn't go over. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I, I got to see some of the memorials. And if you've not seen the, the Vietnam War Memorial, it's, I don't see how you can see that and not be moved. Um, it's not anything fancy, but yet it, it has the names of all the people they could verify that have... And I have a picture that gives a few. Jorge Hayes. Willie C. Hardy. Lionel Maldonado. And one of the things that was really interesting and moving as we were there were people taking pieces of paper and, and, and rubbing the names of those people that they knew or served with or whatever. And I just, I just thought of that and I, I thought of the, the, see, when you put a name on something, it, it, it personalizes it in a way that just a chunk of metal, a stone doesn't. When you put a name on it, there's, there's a person there, and, and there's literally thousands of people on this thing. And I, I was just, I didn't, I didn't know anybody that went to Vietnam and lost their life that I'm aware of. I, I'm sure my mom could tell me, well, you knew this person, this person. And I go, okay, okay, I did know some people. But I, to my recollection, I don't. And yet, th there they were, all giving their life <laughs> for, and if you remember Vietnam, often they didn't even agree with, but yet gave their life anyway. And then another memorial I've been to, um, and I do this, I do other things besides go to memorials, but um, is the Oklahoma City bombing memorial. If you've ever been there. Again, it's, 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 I don't see how you can walk through that place and not just have your heart just broken. Um, there's a big reflecting pool that's just really calm and just seems to calm the whole place down. And I don't know, there may be signs not to talk very much, but I don't think you'd even need them. Because people just know when they walk in there, this is not a place to, to, to goof around. And then there's chairs representing all the people that were lost. And in one area, there's a whole bunch of small chairs indicating children because there was a nursery in the building when it, when it was blown up. And, and I didn't remember this until I looked it up. But they have names there too. But they have 600 names 
of those who survived on the only surviving wall to the building. And I thought, again, people, specific people. That's what names are all about. And so as you think about just people in your life, I think of, I didn't ever meet my, my uncle, Lala. He was shot down in World War II. And, um, and so we'll probably go to his grave today and, and, and we'll, we'll pay a level of respect to that. My dad, who served. Um, others, who served. And, and just, again, just remembering everyone that, that we've had in our life, that we've had the pleasure of having in our life. And, and so I just pray that, you know, through this weekend and get an extra day off and all those kind of things, I pray that, that part of that will just be a little reflecting time of people in your life that, um, that help you become the person you now are. Today we're going to talk about the name of God that is most familiar and then how Jesus used that name to not only frustrate the Jewish people, I don't know that he intentionally did that, um, but, but certainly he made them think about what who he was in a different kind of way. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Exodus, I just realized I didn't even put down the chapter. I'll find it in a minute. Exodus 3. I'm going to make sure I have this. Sorry about that. I just glanced up and said, oh, I didn't put the book or the chapter. That's good, Gene. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, Exodus 3, verse 7. We'll start there. <clears throat> and the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them cry out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them <clears throat> from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and you will be the sign, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to sent me to you, and they ask me, Well, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of you, is your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. And this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And so, the, so let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for just again God revealing himself through his name to Moses and to us. And so God, as we look at these, this, this, this principle of your na his name and as we begin to unpack the way Jesus used it, God, I pray that you would help us again with the truth that you have for us, the truth that you want to speak into our souls, so that we might leave this place and, and, and live more and more for you this coming week. God, that's what this is about. This is about a transformation. Everyone who ever encountered God and Jesus was never the same again. 
And so, God, I pray today in this, in Murray, Missouri, there might be some folks that encounter the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that they never live the same again. I pray that for me, and I pray that for everyone here. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so this is an account of Moses. If you remember that as the story starts, he has the burning bush that is not being consumed. He walks over to it. And this is the conversation they have because after 400 years, God has decided to move in regards to the, the Israelites. Now, you can have a lot of questions there. And uh, as, as we say sometimes, I'm going to ask God when we get to heaven, but heaven's going to be so great, we're not going to ask God, so don't worry about it, okay? But for whatever reason, God was ready to move in this moment. And, and so he, he called out the man who he, he had had nurtured to do that. Now, if you remember what happened to Moses, this uh, kind of a retelling, and, and one of the great, uh, um, it's the cartoon they did on Moses. is really cool because, I mean, his parents put him in this basket and push him out in the river and go, good luck. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. Uh, and, 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 and this particular uh, rendition of it has him going through waves and has alligators going by him and all this kind of... And, and you know, before I had never really thought, I, I kind of thought, okay, they saw these people right down the stream, so they just kind of nudged him out. He floated down the stream and got there. And that might be what happened, but the one with the alligators going by him was pretty cool too because you understood that, that God was in charge and God was doing something and there was nothing going to thwart that. God was, God was getting Moses to the place he had to get him, and that was to Pharaoh's house. And so, of course, he was raised in Pharaoh's house and stayed there. And so he knew the workings of Pharaoh's house until the time when he saw one of his Israelite brothers being treated wrong. And, you know, that kind of story, if you haven't, you can read up on it. And, and he, he kills a guy and, and then eventually runs off because he thinks he's thinks he's going to be in trouble. But the background there, it wasn't, see, Moses wasn't just picked out of the air. Moses was groomed to, 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 in a good way, okay, not in a bad way. Uh, he was prepared to do this work. But yet he still had trepidation. Well, who am I supposed to say sent me? And that famous word, I am who I am. And that's who God called himself, the great I am. Another way you can look at it, I will be who I will be. <clears throat> I kind of like this one. I, I cause to be what is. Listen to that. I cause to be what is. Now one of the mindsets of the Israelite people believe God as creator is that he creates each next moment. So in their mindset, if he does not create the next moment... It doesn't happen. Now that's, I know, Sunday morning you're like, whoa, I didn't drink enough coffee. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's hard, isn't it? I mean, that's heavy. That's like, whoa. But, but, but that's their, their idea of God. Is he's intimately involved in creation. So much so that every moment is created by him. And if it isn't, we're done. And so this idea that I cause to be what is. Now God, God's name, <coughs> it's always in the affirmative. It's always free to act and to be as God wills. Always. And that's what this, the earliest Greek also used one, I am the one who is, I am being, uh, a couple other ways they describe it. One way I've heard it, and it wasn't anything I read, but I've heard it that I am kind of means I am everything you need me to be. Anything you need that you can ever think of that you will need, I am. And so, so the, the words that actually means is, is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and it's, I practice this word, but I'm not going to do it. Tetragrammaton. It just means four letters. But it became so holy to the, the, to the Jewish people that they would not even say it. And so it occurred about 6,000 times in the Old Testament. And every time it occurs, they would not say that name. Now you've got to remember, you know, the um, Hebrews did not use vowels. They just had consonants. 
And you were supposed to know the scriptures well enough to know what vows to put in, which I think is presumptuous. But anyway, that's, that's what they did. That's just how they worked. And so Yahweh was this divine name, but they wouldn't say it, which again is kind of interesting when, he, when God says, this is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. I'm just like, seems like you should be using this name. But they were doing it out of, out of reverence for him. He was so holy and so other that they didn't use the name. And so what they began to use is a name called Adonai, which again means Lord. Now, if you look at your translation of your, of your Old Testament, whenever all four letters are capitalized, that means it's actually Yahweh. Now, the first L in a lot of translations is still bigger than the rest of it, but the other words are capital letters. And so if you see that, what you're reading, you read Lord, but what you're actually reading is Yahweh. On the other hand, Adonai is lowercase letters. So it's Lord, but with a lowercase O, a lowercase R, a lowercase D. And so that's how they came up with this. And, and so, so that's how you can kind of tell the difference as you're reading the, your English translation. That's the key they've given you. Now, in the Middle Ages, the pronunciation of Yahweh was lost because of, you know, it's Dark Ages, all that kind of stuff. And um, so some Jewish scholars began to put vowels in to try to help them remember. So what they did was they took the vowels for Adonai and they took the consonants for Yahweh and they put them together, making Jehovah. Jehovah is a Latin translation because if you call, if you're up on your uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know that. Um, I know, some of you got it. Um, <laughs> Jehovah does, even though it's Yahweh, it doesn't start with Y because why? Latin doesn't have a Y. They only have a J. Almost cost him his life, but he, he made it. Anyway. <laughs> And so Jehovah is not really a name that's in the scriptures directly. It was put in the scriptures by, uh, in, back, in, in the, in the, back in the day, and it's a combination of those two words. But most scholars believe that now the, uh, the way you pronounce it is Yahweh. And so Jesus took this I am statement, especially in the book of John, and so if you want to turn to John, we can get ready and begin to make statements about himself. Now you have to understand over the thousands of years before Jesus that the Israelites were there, they never used the name Yahweh. They never said, I am. They never used it. And so for him to say these statements was just like, <gasps> you know, it kind of was like, I mean, it was just like they couldn't believe it. Um, kind of a funny thing happened to my first pastor, and Vicky's going to start laughing at me already, because this, um, we were having a dinner afterwards, uh, after church. And for, I think it was Mother's Day or something. And so guys were getting the meal ready, right? And so uh, this lady that, just a sweetheart, she was a piano player, all those kind of things. Must be go with piano playing, sweethearts. But anyway, um, the, um, she would made this angel food cake and she used like special eggs, like, what were they, turkey eggs, yeah, and all this to make it really nice, nice, fluffy, and light, and, and, and this guy comes up with a knife and goes, whack, 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 <laughs> and cutting it up, and, and, and all the air in the basement was sucked out when that happened. I'm just telling you, this woman goes, <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what happens <coughs> in a much more serious way. Well, maybe not for her. She thought it was pretty serious. But um, in a much more serious way when Jesus used these words. They couldn't believe it. They're like, this guy's been a pain since the day we met him, and now he's even a bigger pain. Because you just don't say those words. And yet he did. And this is what he began to say. So we've got seven statements out of John that have to do with I am. 
The first one's in John 6. There's several places he says it, but 35 is the first one. <coughs> John 6, 35. And he says, I am the bread of life. Now these are statements we're probably familiar with if we read the New Testament very much. But again, try to, try to imagine being someone who's never said this ever in his life and was like, they thought you'd almost like die instantly if you did kind of thing. And then Jesus comes up and says, I am the bread of life. Now we know what he was talking about. I mean, bread is a basic staple for their diet. It also hearkened them back to when they were in the wilderness. They survived for 40 years on manna, right? Bread from heaven. And so they understood the, the, the ramifications of this, that, that Jesus is saying about himself that I am the one that you get nourishment from. I am the one that sustains you. I am the one that gives you all of those things. Not just physical life, but spiritual life. That's what he was saying to these people. And they're like, whoa. And so they're like... But then he goes on later in John. John 8, 12. I'll give you a chance to turn there. He makes this statement. I am the light of the world. Now if you've read commentaries or even just study Bibles about John, you know that John uses this light darkness kind of imagery. Um, that's just how one of the themes throughout John is light and darkness. And basically it's light reveals things and darkness hides things. I don't know about you, but recently you may have noticed in the news that, that people are to, he did this and brought, I, I saw somebody shoot somebody the other day on TV. Gosh, we can see that way too much. But, um, and one of the things that just blew people away is he did it in broad daylight. And that's one of the things that's happening. If you read a lot of the news now, a lot of the things aren't happening in the dark where they used to. They're happening in the light. They're happening in broad daylight. Which just means how, 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 how broken we're becoming. Because we don't even wait for it to get dark anymore. But that was the motif, was the idea that the darkness hides things and evil occurs in the darkness. And if you talk to policemen, they, they tell you you're right. That's, that's where most stuff happens. And light on the other hand re, reveals things. And so, so he says, I am the light of the world. The world is in darkness and Jesus can be a guide. That we're not to walk in darkness, we're to walk in light. Those are the kinds of things John said. And then in John 10, Verses 7 and then also 9. He says this, I am the door of the sheep. And so the idea is that Jesus protects his followers as a shepherd protects those. They, they bring him into an enclosure at nighttime. That's what he's talking about. I'm the door that keeps people from coming in. We had chickens one time and we didn't get them in like we were supposed to. And guess what? The next morning, they were, they were not around. Because we didn't get them put up. We didn't protect them. And so that's what Jesus does. He protects the flock. See, others are thieves and robbers. And they come to kill, kill steal, and destroy. That's what John 10.10 10 says. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Right? And so that's what Jesus is the door to. But he says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And so when you allow Jesus to be your, the door of, of allowing things into your life, you're opening yourself up to a life you could never have on your own. The next one is John 11. It's the story of Lazarus. You've heard this one before. I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. 
Death is not the final word for those that follow Jesus. It's just not. Now, that doesn't mean you don't miss him. I, I heard of a, fr a friend of mine whose who's, uh, mother-in-law went to be with the Lord. And, and, and there was sadness, but, you know, she was 92. She'd had a good life, and she was becoming mentally, you know, just what happens over time, dementia, things like that. And she goes, man, we know, we know exactly where she's at. And there is such comfort there. There's such comfort to know that that person is now in the presence of Jesus. But I love the way it says this because, because he says, even if he dies, he will live. And he's talking about Lazarus. But not only that, you may remember this, going back to Abraham again. Abraham 11, you can turn there if you want, but you can just listen. Now remember, Abraham took, took Isaac, his one and only son, the promise that, that his nation was going to be built through, took him up to, and was going to sacrifice him until God stopped him at the last minute. And in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews reflects back on that in, verse, in, in chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Now think about that for a minute. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be rekindled. Reckon. So, so he's about to sacrifice the very gift that God had given him because God said, yeah, do it. And I love what he says here. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So what, what he's saying here is, is he, he was going to do it because he knew that, hey, God could raise him back up. Because God is the resurrection and the life. Even back in the Old Testament, Abraham understood that. And, I, and I, I'm just praying and hoping that, that you get, we've talked a lot about life here. We've talked about how people are searching for life through all kinds of things. In new ways that we maybe never had before. And, and the idea is that Jesus is the only one that's going to give you life. He's the only one that's going to resurrect your dead body. And he's the only one that's going to give you life in this life. It's not going to be anything you do. It's only going to be Jesus. In John 10, he also says this. Going back there in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. So Jesus is not only the door, but he's the good shepherd. And so he's committed to caring and watching for you and for me. Isn't that good to know? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, those, the, the, Jesus embodies that because he is the good shepherd. Uh, one of my seminary professors told me a story and it stuck with me for years now because I'm we, we used scrolls when I went to seminary. And so, um, that didn't go over either, man. You guys are a tough crowd today. No, just kidding. Um, but he was, he was in Israel. And this, I didn't get to see this in Israel. I wish I would have, but I didn't get to see it. But he said he was, he was somehow, he's kind of, I don't know, I forget exactly the circumstances, but he was, he was, over, he was on a hill overlooking a well. And he said these shepherds, three different shepherds came into this well. And I, now I don't know about you, I, I've done a little bit with livestock, not anything with sheep, so I don't know anything about sheep. But I'm just thinking about cattle going, oh my gosh, what a pain that would be. You know, because they all got mixed in together. And so the three shepherds are, you know, they're watering their sheep and they're talking, and then they sit down and take a little siesta thing and they're just chatting for, you know, talking about whatever shepherds talk about. And, and the sheep are just mingling with each other. You know, it's not like you, they're trying to keep their... They had three pins or anything like that. They're just mingling with each other. And he said the coolest thing happened when they left. Because the shepherd, you know, they're not like, hey, is that yours? And he, they didn't go through the sheep trying to, you know, divide them up. The she shepherd just started walking away, calling his sheep. And he said it was the coolest thing that he ever saw. Because the sheep just started kind of going after their shepherd. And so after they got far enough away, the sheep were all back in their little groups following their shepherd. And he said, what an amazing picture of how we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to know a shepherd's voice. 
One of the basic things we ought to be able to do as a Christian is know a shepherd's voice. We ought to be able to read the scripture and have it resonate deep in our soul and say, oh yeah, th- I, I got to do this. Or, or, or we've got to be out with maybe not the scripture around, but just kind of by, by God's spirit, just know that this is something God's drawing me to. And other things I start to go toward, and you can just tell. Not sure that's the way I'm supposed to go. But that's ought to be how we have that. That ought to be, as, a, as sheep, we ought to be able to do that. That should just be a basic requirement. So and then verse in chapter 14, John 14, 6. Again, a verse you're familiar with. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now again, think back to that early, you know, early century. You're a Jewish guy listening to Jesus talk. And he's using words you don't even utter. And then he's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When you have given yourself to Yahweh, even if you didn't say it. And here's a guy saying, I'm that person. And so, although today a lot of people don't want to believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, back then I don't think it was a really popular deal either. There was an exclusiveness to Jesus. And unfortunately, I think too often we have come across in a way that, that, that we sound, <laughs> as one person said it, we sound like the most uncaring people in the world. Because we come across very, um, if we're not careful, very arrogantly. But well, Jesus is the only way. You haven't got Jesus, you ain't got it. Sorry, I'm right, you're wrong. I mean, if we're not careful, that's how we come across. Now, that doesn't mean it's not true, but I really do believe we can do a better job. I believe we can help people see that Jesus is the only way, and that's a really good thing. We've been talking to this guy, James, out in California, and and one of the things he said is, we've got to rediscover that the gospel is good news. That, that for so many people, even believers, they're like, oh, is this really good news? I mean, it is good news. It's the greatest news ever. And yet so oftentimes, if we're not careful, just by the way we say things, we come across in, a, in an arrogant and uncaring way. And I don't think we represent Jesus well then. I think there's a way we can say Jesus is the only way without coming across uncaring. In fact, I, I love this one message by this guy that, that talks about it. And he just, he just says, if, if we're truly going to honor people's choices, if that's really what we're going to do, then, then there has to be a way. Not everything, not, not everybody in here's favorite color is blue. Right? Not everybody in here likes Chinese more than any other fa- food. I mean, our choices matter. And I love the way he unpacks that. And he uses this idea of choices to say, if, if that's true then, the only way that God truly honors you is if he honors your choice, even if your choice is to not choose him. And so Jesus doesn't come across as, I'm the only way, ha, ha, ha. No, Jesus is just saying, I'm here. I've come for you. Think of the other world religions, if you know anything about them at all. Not one time do any of them claim to have someone come to people so that they can have life. None, none, they don't. They, they don't do it. Christianity is a... Is, is just radically different. It's not just kind of different. It's radically different. Other world religions, either it's by fate or by performance you get in. By fate is if, if God happens to like you the day you die, then you get in. Or oh, that's what they believe. 
Did you know, even though Muslims have a lot of things they have to walk through, in the end, the Muslim faith is a, is a fatalistic faith. Because in the end, it's up to Yahweh, I mean, not Yahweh, it's up to Muhammad. If Muhammad says, yeah, come on in, great. But you can jump through every hoop they have and yet not make it because Muhammad's having a bad day. And the other, the other one is you perform. If you do enough good stuff, you might make heaven. Now, I know about you, but that, that's hard because <laughs> I don't do that much good stuff. <laughs> but Christianity is different. And it's different because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he recognizes that, that fatalism is not the answer. And he recognizes that performance isn't either. And he comes and says, I came for you. I came for you. Are you going to receive the gift that I'm giving you? No strings attached. You don't have to do anything. Now once you make that decision, your life ought to change. But it doesn't change up front. And that's radically different than any other world religion. The last one, John 15. I am the true vine. See, we attach ourselves to Jesus. The nourishment we need flows through Him. If you read, haven't read John 15 for a while, man, I'd encourage you maybe take a few minutes to do that because it's just, it's just full of so many things. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing that really matters. That's what he says. He says he's going to prune you because he wants you to produce more fruit. And we can all jump for joy for that, right? Of course not. We don't like that. But yet it's an important part. If you're a gardener at all, you know that's an important part of, of producing more fruit is having things cut off of you. Now, you know, again, I don't know if the plant goes, ouch, but I know I do when it gets pruned off of me. I go, oh, man. <laughs> Every time Jesus uses this word, Describing himself, he, he just lit those guys up because they were just, oh, how dare you? But yet he was trying to help them see he was more than what they thought he was. He was really the Messiah that came to save the whole world, just like John the Baptist said. And so today, as you think about your life, and you think about those I am statements. Is there a statement that hits you more than the others? Is there one that you need to really reflect on and think about and allow God to use in your life? If there is and you want to come down and pray, I'll be happy to pray with you. But Jesus made some radical statements that if we're not careful, we just kind of gloss over because we don't understand the background. I just wanted to help you understand the background today. These statements were, they, they, they were just blown the people away. And yet he made them so that they knew who he was. And so as Charlotte comes to play, and as we just think about this, I pray that you'd allow God's Spirit to just show you, show you maybe a specific arena or an area that you may need to just give over to the Lord again. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And again, uh, your name. I am that I am. Yahweh. Everything we need you to be, you are. There is nothing lacking in you. 
And so, God, if we need comfort, you give comfort. If we need peace, you give peace. If we need healing, you do that in a, in a way. God, everything. And so, God, as we uh, think about Jesus and the statements he made, I pray that we'd allow those to sink into our souls and that we might leave this place different because we've encountered the living Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. with God. Probably going to jump into a meal or maybe some time with family. Sing the Lord. I surrender Please.